<clears throat> what's always sort of mystified me when the people who choose the Gospels to read on a particular Sunday <clears throat> choose this one to read on the reign of Christ. After all, this is the last Sunday in the year before we begin the journey to Bethlehem. And we're on the other end of Jesus' life. And next Sunday is first of Advent. So why on earth are we reliving, reliving the suffering of Jesus now? It, it seems to me that this picture is not the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of man with all its conniving, mocking, violent ways, the kingdom of man. But you know, it does make me wonder what this world would look like if we actually lived what Jesus taught. Imagine that. What would it look like? How different would the news be at night? And maybe this is the reason this reading happens now. You know, now right before we uh, observe in the United States Thanksgiving, now just before the holidays begin, and for many of us, we start missing those who won't be here with us. That's right. Maybe all the selfishness and dividedness of humanity that put Jesus on the cross is the contrast we need for thanksgiving. Jesus even shows us the way. He says he breaks down any barrier between the thief hanging alongside of him and assures him, this day you will be in paradise with me. That's the thing about Thanksgiving. If we, when we do it right, Thanksgiving is a celebration of our unity with people around the table, even if there are empty chairs, even if we're fighting over a turkey leg, we are unified. You know, we call ourselves a pilgrim people in this church. What does that really mean? Really mean in terms of what the people who brought their Bibles along on the Mayflower experienced as far as fear and fortitude. I'm sure maybe a few of us can trace our lineage back to that vessel, the Mayflower, but not most of us. It wasn't the Mayflower for us, but maybe a steamer boat that took our family from Hungary or Germany. Or in my case, my great-great-grandparents, two indentured servants, paid for their passage with years of servitude. Maybe your relatives came here before there was a Statue of Liberty to greet them. And maybe they got here from Asia via the West Coast and worked on the railroad. Maybe the journey was one spent chained in the hold of a ship from Africa. Or maybe it was much more recent than that. Maybe your family's Mayflower was an aerpl airplane from the Caribbean or a ship that rescued your relatives away from na Nazi death camps. It it really doesn't matter. We are all still a pilgrim people. The thing is, <clears throat> we must all still work to understand that God blesses us, blesses us all. It's part of uh, humanity's flawed nature to think of one thing, me first, me first. Even in today's gospel, one of the hecklers says to Jesus, if you're God, save yourself. But gratitude, real gratitude, is not a one-person deal. Adam J. Copeland, who, who blogs from Luther Seminary in St. Paul, made me think of this when he said the, the following. He says, <clears throat> at Thanksgiving, many of us end up asking that question, what am I thankful for? What am I thankful for? Shirley Guthrie, his friend, seems to want to broaden our thinking from I to we. What if Thanksgiving is not about what God gives me, 
but what's God's gifts, what are, what about God's gifts to all the world now and forever? Thinking of Thanksgiving in this corporate manner then pushes us to consider Thanksgiving as action, as call to discipleship. It becomes more than about feeding the homeless turkey and mashed potatoes on Thursday, but about making sure all my brothers and sisters, all who, those whom God created and loves, have equal opportunities to enjoy God's gifts. Our innate problem with the, uh, the me first issue isn't just an issue for today. It was true for the pilgrims themselves, you know, that they were not a band of, of sainted people with buckles on their hats. They, in fact, were real people. Our pilgrim answers, ancestors were as flawed as we are today, but our sanitized history often doesn't tell us about that. But it should, so we understand how we are. Yes, they came to this continent so they could seek to worship in peace rather than be persecuted by the English and their king. But their motives were far from pure. And we need to understand that so we understand ourselves. The pilgrims had other motives for risking their lives to reach America, selfish motives that manipul manip manipulated people they did not see as brethren, especially the ones they found here. They believed a theory in England about the second coming of Christ. You see, early, early explorers met America's natives in the 1600s, and when they heard the natives speaking, speaking they believed that the native North Americans were speaking Hebrew, Hebrew, which the English didn't understand either. So they figured they, they must be the lost tribe of Israel. And everyone knew that Jesus would not return until all the so-called lost Hebrews were converted to Christianity, whether they wanted to be or not. And so here's another thing that our sanitized history doesn't mention. Of the 102 passengers on the Mayflower that sailed in September 1620, only 37 were the pilgrim separatists going for religious freedom. The rest were all investors, investors in, the, in, in it for the money. And in fact, all the pilgrims were too. According to historian John C. Turner, they, the pilgrims and what they called adventurers, formed a joint stock company and a partnership that would last for seven years. Individuals received shares on the basis of their investment, or in the case of the passengers, for undertaking the work of planting a colony. The point was, to, was, here we go with the materialism, to ship furs and other commodities back to England. And at the end of seven years, the shareholders would divvy up the profits. So the pilgrims stood to gain both spiritually and financially. But what they didn't expect was how harsh life would become when they finally reached land. It was a starving journey. You know, have you ever wondered, you know, that the pilgrims, when they first landed, landed at Provincetown. Have you ever wondered why the pilgrims, when they landed at Provincetown, didn't stay there and instead went on to Plymouth? The thing was, when they landed, they only found many, many native graves. And figuring that they might find gold in the graves, they started digging them up. And no gold. But a little farther on, they found a huge, huge deposit, a store of buried seed. The hungry pilgrims feasted on the seed and gathered it all up as much as they could get. And that was about the time that the native Nauset tribe that lived there showed up to find the graves of their loved ones desecrated. And most of the seed gone that the Nausets always 
set aside and hid to plant the next year so they'd have a harvest again. You know, the Dautnossets had good reason to despise any of the Europeans. Years later, there was a British explorer, Thomas Hunt, who arrived on the Cape, not only to exploit all the wonderful resources of seafood, seafood and, and other game, but to take captive and enslave, enslave some of the natives, take them back to England and train them as interpreters. Ironically, one of these natives would be Squanto, who would come to rescue the pilgrims when their fragile state of health began to take its toll. Their own tribe among the Nossets had been decimated by a plague that came with Hunt and his men. Of that first winter, after they had moved to Plymouth, Governor Bradford wrote, deaths mounted, eight in January, 17 in February, 13 in March. Then, by then, he said, barely half the passengers remained alive. The living were scarce able to bury the dead. So many empty chairs. So many hopes seemingly buried. And despite the sorrows that European ex explorers had brought them, the indigenous, indigenous Wampanoag tribes, led by Squanto and Massasoit, kept the pilgrims alive and gave them knowledge on how to cultivate the soil. By harvest time in that year, things were much improved. And Governor Bradford wrote that the settlers might, after a more special manner, rejoice together. The separatists were not a happy people, but they, and they disliked many forms of entertainment, but they were not complete killjoys. And they happily celebrated their improved fortunes. Bradford this man went and brought a prodigious amount of game to the table, probably duck, eel, and fish. Massasoit and 90 of his men came, and the Wampanoags killed five deer, they added, to the Maori. The pilgrims didn't understand this fest, this, these festivities as a thanksgiving, but as a harvest festival which is exactly what the Wampanoags celebrated every year. God's blessings are bestowed on all God's children, by God's children, in caring for one another and taking care of one another. I can't help but think how those empty chairs reminded the first pilgrims of the price that they had paid for this voyage. And yet the most important part of what we learn as flawed, egocentric human beings is how important the memory, the memory of those absent is to the act of thanksgiving. As a Unitarian colleague of mine says, by being present to the memories that live within us, live within us, gratitude arises and connects us with those we're unable to be with this year or forevermore. As Gary was saying, an empty chair is a potent symbol and found in the ceremony of circumcision for Jewish babies. This is Elijah's empty chair. He is believed to be present for every boy child. Rabbi Robin Fryer Bowson tells us, chairs can evoke memory. On Passover, she relates sitting at the Seder table with family, especially sitting in the same seat every year, which we did in our place, yeah, uh, is something that gives a special meaning. She said, there's a tremendous level of holiness that can be attached to a chair. If we close our eyes, we can remember a time when we were with our loved ones, when they were sitting on a dining room chair at a family meal, a kitchen chair at a weekday dinner, a beach chair on a special vacation, a high chair when they were very young, a wheelchair for too many years. 
all of the people that we have come to remember had lives that encompassed much more than the chairs that they occupied. So today, we remember those who still are very much a part of our holiday and will always be. I hope you'll take home one of these blue votives and make them part of your holiday. In fact, take more than uh, one of them home for anyone who needs them, people you know who are, who are going through, especially a first holiday season without people. Amen. So with that, and hoping for a better news next week, I send you forth to be, to be the accent, the, the activeness that is required of us as disciples at Christmas, to be the ones who do more than dish to be, to be the ones who do, do, do more than dish Thanksgiving turkey and mashed potatoes and then we're done. We're not done. The point of our church and the point of our lives is a just world for all. A just world for all. And you, friends, are the ambassadors for that whatever you do and however you interact. May God bless and keep you. May God make you strong and active and enthusiastic. And may God guide you to those who need you the most. Amen.